So we've talked about a little of genetics and we've talked about mutations. Now let's talk about one of the bad outcomes of a mutation. Um, that would be tumors or cancers. When you look at the word cancer, the cancer actually originated from a long time ago with the Greeks and Hippocrates actually named it. And he named it for these appendage-like projections that are coming from the tumor. When he looked at them, he would said it looked like a crab. So they were called carcinomas, which is referring to a crab shape. Up here in the top corner, you can see this is an actual tumor or cancer cell. You can see it branching out with these, these appendages, and then here you see a purple crab with the very similar characteristics. So when we say things are neoplasms, we're actually saying it's a tumor. So a neoplasm is an abnormal new growth, and that's a tumor. Tumors can be cancer, but they don't have to be. Cancers are usually, you can think of in your mind, as very destructive, where a tumor is just an abnormal growth. You can have a tumor growing on your back and just creates this ugly lump, and it may not be life-threatening. But if you have a cancer, then that cancer is being very destructive to the tissue around it. In that situation, we call it to a, call it a malignant neoplasm or a malignant tumor. And of course, oncology is a study of, of tumors and cancers. So let's talk about how you name these things. And we're going to talk about first the benign tumors, which means they're not malignant and destructive. The benign tumors are just abnormal growths. And they name them after the tissue, and then they follow it up with the suffix oma. So if you can figure out some of these, like a lipoma, or think of it as a lipoma, what's it make you think of? Lipids. So this lipoma or a lipoma is actually because of fat tissue, so adipose cells. How about a glioma? Glial cells. So we're talking about nervous tissue cells, gliomas. This is a little bit more tricky, a leomyoma. So when you look at this, it doesn't really pop right out in your head, but what it's talking about is a smooth muscle of the uterus. So I put it in here because it's something you'll probably hear about. Uh, tumors of the uterus or benign tumors are gross in the uterus. And then here's another one, chondroma. Let's see if you can figure that one. Chondra refers to cartilage, and then oma is a tumor. So a chondroma is actually a growth of cartilage, an abnormal growth of cartilage. And there are a couple tricky ones, and the tricky ones are things like epithelial linings versus glands. So if it's an epithelial lining, like the surface of the skin is a lining, they call it a papilloma, so a papilloma. And if it's a gland, they call it an adeno or an adenoma. So here's a nice list over here, and this is from the National Cancer Institute. They have this list and some of the diagrams where, where you should look. And a lot of these words actually tell you where they are, like the word myo. So a myoma is talking about a tumor and a muscle. And I, it's interesting that I picked that one because there are a couple different cells in the body that usually don't tend to form tumors because tumors are rapidly reproducing cells. So cells that normally reproduce that keep growing really quickly. When you think of some of the tissues, when they become differentiated, they shouldn't reproduce. Muscle is one of those. So like, well, I should be specific. Skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle. You know that when somebody has a heart attack, that tissue dies and it's replaced by scar tissue. It doesn't grow new heart muscle because heart muscle can't reproduce. So you don't see a lot of actual tumors or cancers in the heart cardiac muscle itself. The same thing with the brain tissue. When we refer to nervous tissue, you can get, you can get nervous tissue tumors, but to get an actual neuron tumor is actually pretty rare because neurons lose the ability to replicate when they differentiate. But it still happens. Accidents do happen. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples, but nothing really pops into mind. So these are benign tumors. The difference between a benign tumor and a malignant tumor, remember, is malignant tumors are dangerous, and they actually name them differently. So actually, I'm going to flip back for just a second. When you look at some of these, these words like chondroma, what they do is instead of taking chondroma to say a tumor, they'll say it's a chondrosarcoma. So chondrosarcoma. Or um, an adeno, like adenoma for a tumor, it would be an adenocarcinoma, C-A-R-C-I. Noma. <laughs> so here are some examples. So malignant epithelial tumors, remember, are referred to as carcinomas. If it's the gland, then they refer to it specifically as an adenocarcinoma. If it's connective tissue, they call them sarcomas. So something like a rhabdomyosarcoma is actually referring to skeletal muscle tissue. If it were just a rhabdomyoma, it's talking about benign tumor of the skeletal muscle tissue. So when you see the word sarcoma or carcinoma on the end, it's telling you this is definitely a malignant tumor. So in other words, it's a cancer. Right. So cancer is lymphatic tissue, or also known as lymphomas. So there's just one of those misnomer type of things where you can't always depend on the pattern. But in general, you can. 
Another interesting thing are leukemias. Leukemias don't have a benign version. If, it, if you have a leukemia, it's never considered benign. It's always considered malignant and dangerous. And those are um, cancers of blood and lymphatics, leukemias are. All right, so how do you classify these things? We already talked about the naming system. When you look at benign versus malignant, there are a couple characteristics of each of them that help you identify what they are. So benign tumors, one of their key characteristics, so they're usually slow growing, usually. Remember, there are always exceptions to the rule, but they're typically slow growing. So like this, if it's growing under the skin, it's usually isolated off, it's growing super slow, it creates this bump or lump, and it's usually surrounding tissue around the tumors that are causing that bump. So you get this growth in the surrounding tissues are expanding out. So when you feel over it, you're feeling this tissue above the tumor. And it's almost like putting a, a marble under a bunch of pages of telephone book and you feel your fingers across the top. You're actually feeling the, the page of the telephone book, but it's because of something in the underlying tissue. So typically slow growing. Where a malignant tumor grows really quick. They're usually a rapid growing tumor. They have to get, be excised or get gotten rid of really quick. Right? Benign tumors, like I said, they're usually well capsulated or well defined. They stay in a certain specific area, and when you pull them out, you can see they have like a capsule around them. And I'll show you some pictures of tumors in just a little bit. But they're isolated. I know when I used to work with rats, rats got a lot of tumors on, just underneath their skin. And so we would go in, we'd anesthetize them, we'd make an incision, and then we could actually take a little scupula. And a scupula is, well, it's kind of like a little tiny spoon in lab research work. And we'd slide it underneath the tumor and just pop it out like a little tiny marble. Because that tumor was so isolated or so encapsulated, you could just pop it out. And they were benign. They weren't dangerous, so they were easy to remove. So well-defined. They're not invasive. Benign tumors like to stay isolated in their little area. They're just mutated cells that are growing abnormally fast, but they're not destructive. They're just reproducing really quick. They're usually well differentiated. So this tumor, if it's a skin tumor, it'll look like it's surrounding skin cells. So if you pulled it out, it'll look a lot like, it has a lot of the characteristics of skin cells. Right? And then low mitotic index means that they don't go through mitosis a lot. So if you took a sample out and you look, only a small percentage of them would be going through mitosis, where in a malignant tumor, they're rapidly replicating, so you see a lot of mitotic processes going on. So you can see them in anaphase, telophase, metaphase, all of those different things. All right? Benign tumors don't metastasize. They stay isolated to their original tissue that they, they start developing from. So when you look at malignant, you can go through and look at exactly the opposites. Benign is slow growing, malignant is rapid growing, it's where they're very destructive and dangerous. Benign is well defined in a capsule, where malignant, you can see, it's not a normal shape. It's not a nice round shape. It digs out, it sends those appendages, like we were talking about here, out into the surrounding tissue. Basically, it's growing and being very destructive. It's very invasive, which is the next one. So it invades a lot of tissue. Here you can see it actually ulcerates the skin so that that cancer is growing out and it breaks the skin surface. It's killing the skin tissue is what it's doing. These are well differentiated where these are not. These look like stem cells. So they go back and they change really rapidly. They can become anything they want. They can actually, since they have the DNA for anything, if this were a piece of uh, skin, like skin tissue or connective tissue, we'll actually go to connective. Since this connective tissue has all the DNA to be anything in the body, you might actually find that it starts developing and it'll have tooth-like structures or hair-like structures inside of it that are not normal for this type of connective tissue. So they're poorly differentiated. They look more like a stem cell. They're highly mitotic, which means they're going through mitosis rapidly. So when you pull out a sample, you're going to see a lot of things that are in different phases, like anaphase, telophase, metaphase, etc. Right? And then these have a tendency to spread or metastasize. So they grow. They're actually looking for blood. So they look over and they try and find blood vessels. They'll get into the blood vessels and then they'll do what's called seeding and they can actually drop individual cells into the blood to go downstream. Or the same thing with lymphatics. They go over to the lymph vessels, they seed into the lymph vessels and they let the, those cells, those, those cancer cells go downstream, basically floating downstream through the circulation and then they set up a shop or a home somewhere else. So those are the main keys or main differences. And there are going to be a couple of cancers that I'm really going to go through over and over again, like the more common cancers like lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer. And I'll use those as a lot of examples because these are the things you're going to have to get experience with or you'll, you'll have the most exposure to. So one in three of us are going to get a breast cancer, a lung cancer, or, or a, a prostate cancer. So it's something. If you're sitting in a room with people, I'd normally have you look to the left and to the right and think, you know, it's going to be one of you three that's going to get one of these cancers. So you really want to get familiar with this material. 
And the first sample I'm going to show you, or example, I'm going to compare benign versus malignant using breast cancer. So here are the examples from before. Here you have a benign, here you have a malignant. If you're to look at the pathology, so you take a little sample and you look underneath, you stain these cells and you look underneath, cancer cells have a tendency to stain darker in color. So they have like really dense nuclei, very dark nuclei, and I'll show you more examples later. But you can see a lot of these cancer cells here. When you zoom in on a malignant tumor, you can see all these dark areas. Those are all cancer cells. You can see how these are kind of isolated to an area where these, they're branching out all over the place. They've actually started seeding and putting out their other uh, cancer cells at random areas. So benign versus malignant under a microscope slide. This is actually breast cancer. This is a woman that had a benign breast tumor. And the breast tumor, you can see when they start bringing it out, it's isolated, it's encapsulated. So when they bring it out, they can bring it out all in one mass. Like I said, with the rats before, we'd take a scupula and we'd actually make the incision, go underneath, and then just pop that out. So they can just pop it out. When you slice it open, look, it's encapsulated. It has that capsule all the way around the outside, and you can see that tumor mass growing in the middle. So it's very easily to easy to isolate. So when somebody has, you know, they feel a lump, it's not always a cancer. It could just be a benign tumor, which is a good thing. If you catch it early, you can pull that out, right? So usually what they'll do is they'll actually take wherever the abnormal tissue is and then take a little bit more out around it, just in case some of these cells may have turned cancerous. This is an example of someone that had a malignant breast cancer. And you can see, like I said before, the cancer starts growing underneath the tissue and it starts moving out to the surface. And this actually started eating away or destroying the superficial tissue, the skin around the outside. Here you can see it metastasized over to lymph nodes and started destroying your lymph nodes too. Where this is encapsulated, you can see it's isolated. This is not. So when they took this tissue out, you can see it's not very well defined. It's kind of zigzag jagged all over the place. Here you have another one, but it's not well defined, nice and kind of round like this. You can see how jagged it is going around. Right? So we'll use some of these breast cancer, prostate cancer, and lung cancer examples just so you see them. All right, so here's kind of an example of transition. This is a term you should get used to knowing. So this is when a, a cancer goes from benign and actually turns to malignant. Before it's actually left the tissue, they call it carcinoma in situ, or CIS. So here's how it develops. Here you have normal tissue down here. You've got this one mutated cell, or actually a bunch of these mutated cells up here. So these mutated cells are irritated. They start changing. They don't look like they're normal tissue. So if this is simple squamous all the way along, or it could be, I guess, that's eh, more simple columnar. You can see the columns here, how the, the nucleus is closer to the bottom. So here you have simple columnar. Here you can see it starts changing. The nucleus starts shifting. It looks more like simple cuboidal. Here you can see it starting to become stratified. So very different, more stratification. And this one tumor here, or this one cancer cell has become so malignant, it's going through, well, mitosis. It's becoming mitotic. This is dysplasia. These cells don't look like they're normal tissues anymore, and now you have these ones that are looking more like stem cells. Remember, if it just changes the tissue type, that's metaplasia. If it changes and becomes more like stem cells, it's dysplasia. But these are still isolated to the tissue, the actual specific tissue that they started in. In situ is affecting that tissue, and it just barely pushes on that basement membrane. Once it becomes invasive, it pushes in through and actually goes into other tissues or surrounding tissues. So in situ means it's still isolated into the original tissue. So if it's in a gland or, a, or a, a covering in this example, it stays in the covering for in situ. Ideally, when somebody gets a pap smear, what they're looking for are in situ neoplasms. They're looking for something that's changed on the surface so they can actually excise it, pull it out, and they can get it before it has a chance to go deeper and spread. So here's another example where you can see it in a gland. So here's some breast tissue. It's glandular tissue. These are called alveoli, and these alveoli make milk. You know, like the alveoli in your lungs hold air, the alveoli in the, in the breast make milk. And here you can see all of these tissues, the abnormal cells growing inside that gland. They're still isolated to that area, so they're called carcinoma in situ. And the nice thing is that carcinoma in situ, if it's caught early enough, it's 100% curable. So when they have that lump or that mass, or like I said with uh, cervical cancer, when somebody gets a pap smear, it, when they see it and they isolate all that tissue and pull it out, it's 100% curable. All right, so who gets cancer? And I love this picture. This always reminds me of my grandmother, because my grandmother smoked almost her entire life until about the last year of her life. 
and she lived to be almost 90. So this kind of reminds me of her cancer schmancer. Some people just don't get cancer very easily. Other people, they could smoke for a year and then presto, they have lung cancer. And we'll talk a little bit about that too. But let's look at some of the statistics with cancer. Actually, I'm sorry, let's go back and do a homework. I had the first homework before we go into this. So go ahead and jot this down. We were talking about naming and, and the different types of cancer. So the first homework question is, uh, what's a terra carcinoma and what's a teratoma? So they're both obviously coming from the same type of tissue, but what your job is to do is find out what type of tissue they come from. When did these things actually start forming in life? So when did they originally form in the body? Okay. And then where do they typically come from? And what do they do? I'm sorry, and what do they do? What do they usually form? What's interesting about a teratoma is that it may not have, even though it's a tumor, it may not have clear cl cut specific tissue. So you're going to look and see what types of tissues it can form. All right, now it's kind of this cancer schmancer bit. So let's look at some statistics. All right, so cancer overall is the second leading cause of death right behind heart disease. So heart disease kills about 600,000 people in the United States every year. Cancer takes about 570,000 people. So it comes in a very, very close second. And you can see the breakdown of all the deaths in the United States, heart disease being number one, cancer being another. Right? But the overall mortality rate of a cancer is about 50%. So mortality of people getting cancer is about 50%. Some things to keep in mind is that some cancers are almost always lethal, where some cancers are more of a nuisance, like skin cancers. The number one cancer that people get is skin cancer. But it's also the number one curable. Why? Where does it happen? You know, what makes it so curable? Well, number one is it's on the surface of your skin. We're so vain when we see any kind of abnormal bump, we go to the dermatologist and say, get that thing off. We don't even care if it's a cancer at that point. It's just ugly and we remove it, right? So if it were cancerous, when we get it plucked off or frozen off, then it's gone. We've cured it, right? So it's, sometimes it's more of a nuisance, but it is the most common cancer, but it's easily, easily treated. Um, and that's why they're seldom fatal is because they usually don't get a chance to metastasize. Right? It's the least common cancers are usually the highest or most fatal, like pancreatic cancer. So pancreatic cancer has a very high fatality or mortality rate. Um, cancers are so challenged to deal with because of a lot of factors. One is the cause. There's so many causes we're going to discuss the causes of cancer. So when you're trying to eliminate the cause and trying to reverse what the cause did, that's one problem. There are so many types of cells that each cell behaves a little bit differently. So it's kind of like adding factors and factors on top of factors. Right? And then the treatments for those different things have to vary so much. So you could potentially have thousands of types of cancers out there, which means you would have to have thousands of types of treatments, and we just don't. And even the prognosis varies. So like I said, from skin cancer to things like pancreatic cancer. When you look at the most common cancers, look at lung cancer. Of all the lung cancers out there, lung cancer is actually more common than prostate, pancreas, breast, colon cancers all combined. So it's, it's, there's a lot of lung cancer out there. And of course, we know the number one cause of lung cancers. So why is curing cancer so difficult? And I already kind of briefly said this, but you can see that when you're making cells, you can actually have over 200 types of cells in the body. In just one of those cells, look at all the mechanisms that can go wrong. So these are the mechanisms of cancer. It can be something on the surface. It can be any of these second messengers on the inside. It can be something in the DNA. It can be some of the messengers that go into the DNA. It can be anything. It can be the proteins it produces. So 200 types of cells times all of these different possible you know, things that can malfunction, you've got literally thousands of possible cancers. All right, so next. When you, when you look at the three main variables that determine frequency and significance of the cancers, it's really the site that they develop in, the sex that it affects, and the age of the person. Like, for instance, lung cancer versus prostate versus skin. I already said that. With lung cancer, it's the most common out there. So it's going to affect about one in three males and about one in four females. That's a lot of cancer out there. But it's, it's also relatively treatable if you catch it at the right stage. And we'll talk about stages later. Things like colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancers. These are the main cancers that we have scans for that we want to try and detect early because if, if you detect it early, there's a high cure rate. But then there are also pancreatic cancers. By the time we realize somebody has a pancreatic cancer, it's usually at a very dangerous level. 
and we'll talk about things like um, staging and statistics in a little bit, but when you look at pancreatic cancer, there's, there's usually about a 13% five-year survival rate, which means that after five years from being diagnosed, about 13% of the patients are still alive. So that's not a really good statistic. It's a very dangerous cancer. When you look at gender, you can break down by genders. You can see males get more prostate cancers, women get more, more breast cancers. And I, it's funny because the first semester that I taught this, I actually had someone that said, why is it that women don't get prostate cancer? And I had to stop for a second and think, is this person really being serious? Maybe they need to look at their anatomy a little bit better. But yeah, so when it's males, prostate cancer is the most common male cancer, and with females, breast cancer is the most common. But when you look, lung cancers come in a very close sec second in both of the people. So overall, total statistics, lung cancer actually beats out prostate and breast cancers. But you can see the different types. And then age is another significant one. So a lot of carcinomas actually happen in the, in the 70s because cancers are really accumulation of genetic mutations. All the things you've been exposed to all your life that have made changes. So you see a lot more carcinomas in, in the 70s. Uh, things like melanomas, though, actually are pretty common in the 20s and 40s. So there are different diseases out there, different cancers out there that are kind of age dependent. And here's a nice little breakdown of age dependency. You can see early in life, in your, from the time you're about 15 to 19 getting diagnosed with cancers, more people have things like leukemias early in life, but you can see leukemia start shrinking as you get later in the years, so 35 to 39. And then other diseases, miscellaneous things like skin cancers and prostate cancers and stuff, the others start increasing when you're closer to midlife. Right? So you can see the dramatic change this age dependent. Right, let's talk about statistics just a little bit. So when, all through this section I'm going to talk about different statistics and usually the terms I use are going to be incidence, mortality, and survival rate. And we've talked about incidence and mortality. Remember incidence is what? Is the number of people alive today with it or is it the number of new cases every year? Incidence is the number of new cases every year. Where mortality is telling you what? how many people have died from it, right? So mortality is telling you over a specific amount of time how many people have died because of this. So these are things that, that you are already familiar with and they can actually adjust these rates depending on the stage of the cancer. So they may talk about um, the stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four of the cancer and things like that. They may talk about regions. So whether it's localized or it's regional or whatever happened to it and they may adjust the incidence to that or the mortality because of localized or mortality because of regional. So you know these terms but usually they'll tell you specifically what they're measuring. So is it the incidence of this specific type of cancer or that in general? Is it incidence of localized or incidence of regional? Is it mortality because of localized, mortality because of regional, etc. Then this last one here I kind of mentioned already but survival rate. So survival rate's talking about typically over five years. So a person's diagnosed today, and within five years, what percent of those people diagnosed today will actually st still be alive in five years? So they usually list as a five-year mort mortality rate. So when I was talking about prostate cancer a few slides back, and I said that typically it's about 13% survival rate over five years, I meant that if you're diagnosed with prost or prostate, I'm sorry, pancreatic cancer today, five years from now, there's a 13% chance that you'll still be alive. So not really good statistics. But you can see some of these statistics here. So prostate cancer, if you catch it early, there's a 100% cure rate. So almost 100% cure rate. There's a practically 100% percent chance, chance you'll be alive in five years. Breast cancer, if you catch it early, there's a roughly an 89% chance that you're still gonna be alive five years from now. But lung cancer is a little bit more risky. All right, so what makes cancer cells different than normal cells? I wanna take a step back and actually ex make sure you understand what a normal cell does to stay alive. We've kind of reviewed this twice now, but I'm gonna really emphasize the, the key points that are changed in cancer. So the first thing is just their appearance. When you take a biopsy and you look at it, you can see there's a big difference between a normal cell and a cancer cell. So you might see a biopsy tissue like this where you have normal cells around the outside and you see all these cells are going through like mitosis. And this is kind of interesting because here you can see what phase is this? It's anaphase. So here you had metaphase where they were lined up, but then they just split. 
right? You can see condensation of the chromosomes, so condensed chromosomes. So we're looking at prophase here. You can see metaphase going across here. Here you can actually see there's a lot of defects with the DNA, and you can see what's called multipolar mitosis. There you've got lots of splitting and replications. So really interesting. When you look at these cells, they're just really weird. Typically, cancer cells have a lot of nuclei. The nuclei is flawed. It's mutated, and it's this weird changed highly staining substance so they stain a lot differently and I mentioned that before you can see really really dark brown um, nuclei in some of the cancer cells where you see normal dark nuclei in normal cells so here's some of the characteristics that the pathologist looks for when they're looking and I just mentioned several of these next thing is you have to remember normal development so meiosis makes a perfect replication from the parents so mom makes a makes a uh, egg and dad makes a sperm Mutations can happen during that phase. So you can actually have flaws passing it on to your children. Let's say x-rays you know, affect it. Dad's paternal age or fraternal age or mom's paternal age could affect it. So mutations happen. Right? Mitosis, once you fertilize an egg here, remember you go through mitosis. So interphase and then prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis. Every time that you go through these phases, you have to have a perfect or near perfect rep replication. Every time you replicate though, remember roughly one in a thousand of those base pair letters are going to be mutated. So if three billion genes, you've got you know, anywhere between 30,000 and 50,000 mutations that are happening every time a cell replicates. So that's normal. When that gets flawed, a cell can either kill itself through apoptosis or it doesn't replicate anymore or it you know, becomes a cancer cell. Right. Next, those normal cells, they have all these internal clockworks, and that's a common term you hear is clockwork going on inside, where everything is in perfect sync in here. All of these enzymes, all of these chemicals are in perfect sync. So if you have things like a break in the DNA, an alarm goes off, repair mechanisms come in, fix that DNA, then it's allowed to replicate. If you have um, a deficiency of something in the cell, the DNA turns on, makes that deficiency. Cells have a normal perfect mechanisms going on inside. Sometimes when things like UV radiation or viruses come in, they break or they cause problems with the DNA, and the DNA shouldn't replicate. A normal cell at this point will commit apoptosis and die, just so that there's no chance that that mutated cell can carry on. Right? In cancer cells, that doesn't happen. Right? You can see that replication is extremely complex. There's so many internal signals and external signals controlling it. External signals like receptors out here that tell it, hey, you, we need to replicate you because you're missing a neighbor or stop replicating because we're crowded in here. Sometimes inside the machinery, this machinery will turn on and say, hey, we need to turn up production of something or turn off production of something. And if these machines don't work properly, then the cell dies. And here's an example of a combination. You can see these mechanisms that are affecting the inside and the outside of the cell surrounded by the cell cycle here. And we're going to talk about these little black or red lines called checkpoints where a cell will actually go through all the processes, stop at a checkpoint and say, is everything okay? Should I still be reproducing? And if it does, it moves on. It goes to the next one says, everything's still okay? Great, let's reproduce. So we'll talk about those. These are other dysfunctions that happen in cancer cells. I love this because I always anamorph things. I make things as human as I possibly can. And cells are just like little tiny humans. They follow social rules. One social rule is that these cells will migrate. So when you're going from a zygote here, you're replicating through mitosis, these cells start moving into certain patterns and taking a shape for the blastocyst. Here you see the inner cell mass, here you see the outer lining, so you can see the trophoblast layers and all of that. They have this social like um, direction inside of them that tells them where to go. They need to abide by that. Just cells naturally abide by the social rules. They get to the specific areas and they become specific things. Like they'll become a neuron when they get to that area. They'll become a muscle. They'll become cells that produce red blood cells. So they basically go to an area and they know what to do when they get there. They follow those social rules. Another thing is that once they get there, there's a limited blood supply. So here you can see capillaries. All these cells in between, they have to share the blood supply that's coming through. All the nutrients, all the oxygen. So there are a lot of specific amounts of resources and they don't go beyond that. If they, if they get too many of their resources, they do what? Do they hyperplasia or hypertrophy? They hypertrophy, they become hypertrophic, too fat. If they become too fat, then the mechanisms don't work appropriately. And the same thing, if they don't get enough of the nutrients, they atrophy, right? So all cells are like perfectly designed to stay a certain size. 
Cancer cells aren't like that. Cancer cells want to replicate and grow as fast as they can. So what we'll actually see is they will redirect these blood vessels and they pull all the blood they can to them. They get really greedy and stingy. And we'll talk about that. And the last important thing is that they differentiate. So they go to these environmental cues. And like I already said, they know where to go. So they'll follow that pathway. They'll go to a certain area. From there, they have environmental cues that say, hey, you're in the arm. You're going to become a muscle cell and they become a muscle cell. It's a phrase called differentiate. Cancer cells de-differentiate. They, they go backwards. So they can become a certain type of cell and then when they mutate, they actually change backwards and they act more like a stem cell. Normally progression starts as stem cells that can be anything and then they differentiate into one specific cell and then they're done. Cancer cells will actually do this backwards. They become differentiated and then they go backwards and become more like a stem cell and become whatever they want later. It's like redefining themselves. And then these cells, once they get to where they're supposed to be, again, social rules, they will obey the laws. If they're meant to be inside or in between the fingers, they do that. You can see here, four weeks of conception, we really don't have fingers or toes. You can see where they're going to start dipping in. But all these cells that are in there, they say, you know what? I came here, I formed this little flipper limb, and now it's time for me to die so that we can have distinguished fingers. So all those cells in between the others will actually start dying and you get these fingers and these little tiny toes as a result of it. They obey apoptosis. Cancer cells don't do that. Cancer cells become immortal. They don't want to die. So they start producing these growths. They get bigger and larger. So that's normal cells and we're going to talk through the rest of the lecture about what happens with cancer cells and how they defy all these rules. Here's a short list and this is from your textbook. These are kind of the hallmarks of cancer or signs that the cells become cancerous. So self-sufficient. They don't need to be told by other cells what to do. They defy social rules. They're, again, insensitive to anti-growth signals. They defy the social norm. They evade apoptosis. They become immortal. They don't want to die. They keep replicating without rules. They start directing blood vessels to themselves because they're so greedy for blood, and then they start invading the other tissues and start killing other tissues. So these are kind of the hallmark signs, and there are three properties of, can of cancer transformation that we're going to talk about. And here's the first of three properties. So I um, felt like I skipped over something, but I didn't. So cancer cells are autonomous, which means, like I said, social rules, they don't obey by them anymore. It's like you, when you move out of your parents' house, you don't have to obey their rules anymore. So autonomy means that these cancer cells, they don't obey the rules. They move out of their area and then they just do what they want. If you take a normal cell and you put it in a petri dish like this and it's surrounded by other cells, it will form a nice smooth sheet across there. It recognizes it has neighbors and it stops replicating. Cancer cells don't. If you put a cancer cell in the middle of the sheet, what they do is they start growing up above it. They start growing out of that isolated area. They become autonomous, independent from control of the others. So the other ones, once one cell talks to another one, they adhere to each other. They stick to each other and they say, this is where you're meant to be, stay here. But what happens is cancer cells will actually break those little connections. These connections are called ecadherins. So they break these connections and they'll start growing up. They push out. And of course, that's going to be a sign of metastasis when they push out of their normal area and move to other areas. Right? And then they lose that, that arrangement or normal um, structure. Next thing they're considered is anaplastic. So anaplastic means they lose differentiation. Remember, they could become a skin cell, and then they can switch back to become anything they want. They look more like a stem cell. We call that pluripotent. So they have potential to be many things. Omnipotent means they can become anything. A real stem cell, an embryonic stem cell, is omnipotent, which means it can become any cell in the body at once. And that's why they uh, like using embryonic stem cells for research, is because if they put that stem cell in the brain, it recognizes where it's at, it follows its social rules, and becomes a brain cell. If they put it in the arm, it becomes you know, a muscle cell that's in the arm. Pluripotent means that they can become anything they want. And I had you look up that word teratoma and teracarcinoma, and hopefully you know what this is, but teratomas and teracarcinomas are pluripotent. They can become anything they want, pretty much. And when you looked up you know, the definitions, you figured out what they do become. And remember that term dysplasia. Dysplasia means that these cells lose their identity. They become more like stem cells. So here you can see a stem cell that differentiates become what it wants. Here a cancer stem cell doesn't ever differentiate. It can take on characteristics of anything. It can look kind of like nervous tissue, kind of like hair 
It can look kind of like teeth. It can look a lot like different things, right? And they call it pleomorphic because it gets abnormal size, abnormal shape. So even though it may look kind of like a neuron, its shape is really dysfunctional. It may look like a skin cell, but its shape is really weird, right? And the benefit is this allows us to track some of these. So if it started as a skin cell and then we find this um, cell in the brain where normally skin cells aren't, we know where it came from. So it started as a skin cancer and metastasized to the brain. Okay, and then the third characteristic, cancer cells are self-renewing. We know this cycle. Here a normal cell, we talked about this before, normal cell when it's stressed, it'll go through adaptation like this. So it takes cues from the environment and it tries to survive and it proliferates. And if it can't, then it dies. So here you have an adapting cell. It's not surviving very well, it's adapting. And it can't proliferate because it knows it's in a bad situation. Now is not the right time to have you know, offspring, we'll say like that. And then if it can't fix it, it dies. But the problem is that either a normal cell or an adapting cell can actually go through mutations and they overcome cues. They overcome these things that say, you know what, there's something wrong with you, you need to die. And then they actually will proliferate, they'll rapidly replicate, and they keep making flawed copies of the same cell. They ignore their neighbors. They turn on their own survival cues. They tell themselves proliferate. They don't, they don't know that their neighbors are there because they ignore them. And then they just actually keep growing, and they look like stem cells. So those are the three main characteristics. And the last thing is, where do these cells come from? Where do these cancer cells come from? So they can come from three main areas. They can come from a stem cell, so a normal stem cell. You know, you've got the zygote, all the DNA possible, it can become anything at once. So a cancer cell could originate there, a one mutation. It could come from anywhere when you're forming the blastocyst, any of those cells that mutate. So normal stem cells. Another thing is something called a progenitor cell, so a partially differentiated cell. And you want to think of, like in the bone marrow, you have these progenitor cells that become hematocytes. So they become red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, those are progenitor. They can become many things, but they haven't decided to. And of course, when you cause problems with that, you get things like anemia and leukemias, and we'll talk about those. Another one's an already differentiated cell, and I keep mentioning this, but like a, a skin cancer cell, if the skin cancer cell were actually to grow in here, it's differentiated, it knows it's gonna be a skin cell, but if somehow it gets into the lymphatics or the blood as a, different, as a uh, mutated cell, it can go to the brain, it can go to the lungs, it can go anywhere it wants. So three sites. You know, normal stem cells, pluripotent or progenitor cells like bone marrow, and then cells that are already differentiated like an entire um, piece of skin cell. And then the last question for this set is actually homework number three. There are these things called HeLa cells, and if you take another biology class, they're, they're pretty famous or infamous cells. Um, they were the first cells to actually be preserved in vitro. And what you want to look at first is what does in vitro mean? So there are two words, in vivo and in vitro. What does in vitro mean? Right? These cells demonstrate cancer's ability to become immortal. So what you're gonna look up is what are the HeLa cells? So who were they taken from? When were they extracted? And what do I mean by immortal? They become immortal. And then the last thing is what kind of cancer were they taken from? So you can hit pause and then that's the end of this video.